Hey, uh, I just want to finish the, the, the season out with a message today that uh, um, I started to wait till after the year and bring it because I don't really feel ready to bring it. <clears throat> and uh, a couple of things happened in the news this week that kind of spurred me on. So I'm going to read a few verses to you and uh, share something today that I've just called the Creator's Mark. I hope it uh, falls on uh, your ears kindly. I hope it has uh, some value and meaning and relevance to you. I don't know about you, but uh, I know most of you think, uh, we kind of joke about uh, women are much more concerned with their bodies and their appearance than men are. Uh, if you ever dare tell a daughter or a wife or a woman, um, why are you wearing that? That looks, you can upset her week, not, not her day. Uh, she'll go check herself out in the mirror 14 times. She'll wonder why, my gosh, she bought it on sale. Was it, is it so cheap that people can tell? What? And you can tell a guy, why, why are you wearing that? And he's like, because I make it look good. <laughs> I make it. I make the clothes. The clothes don't make me. And, uh, and, and even though that might be a little exaggeration, there's a lot of truth to it. It's much harder to diminish a man's, a boy's ego about himself and his appearance than it is a girl. Uh, that being said, the, the, the truth of the matter is most of us struggle with uh, liking ourselves or thinking we're cool or good from our teen years uh, on into till you get to an age where you don't care anymore, which I think I finally reached about five years ago. Somewhere around 60, 61, you don't care anymore. I don't know if y'all could tell it, but along about then, I even stopped sucking my gut in. I used to try to hold, hold it in, and I learned to talk with it held in for a while. Even thought about wearing a girdle for a while to just kind of help pull it in. I don't know why, because it mattered. I look in the mirror, I don't like the bubble, I bet I can squeeze that in. Not going to lose weight, but I bet I can find a machine <laughs> that'll pull it in. And then somewhere about 60, 61, I'm like, well, I don't care. Look how, how many bellies look this good <laughs> in a shirt like this? I don't care. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not even trying to impress me. Uh, I'm just more comfortable without the artificial sucking in in the belts than I, so. You take, I mean, if you think about it, that means from about 14 to 60, I was troubled. A troubled boy and man. I don't know why we struggle with just accepting who we are and the way we are, we're all so different. Seven billion or so people in the world today, one of the most fascinating things in modern science, criminolo criminology, technology, is that there can be so many thumbprints. Seven billion people and they can identify us because this little piece of flesh right here is different. That, that, I, I don't know about you, but I, I believe if I just started drawing a thumb sized with lines, I don't, I, I don't think I could draw more than a couple of thousand before I had to be duplicating something somewhere. I can't imagine several million. I certainly can't imagine billions, but they're all different. You're unique. You have a unique identifying factor right, just right there. Some of you, of course, have had to uh, use it much more than others have. <laughs> but, but at least when you use it, there's no question that it's you. You're the one they were after, and they know it right here. Because God made you different. Read with me. The Creator's Mark, Psalm 139, first verse. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. <clears throat> you know when I sit down 
and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not too dark for you. The night is bright as the day. Darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Isn't that a great passage explaining that God made us, knew us long before we were made, knows everything about us, knows what you're going to say before you say it, and I don't even know that sometimes. When I open my mouth and God knows what I'm going to say, He's, he's, he's arranged my days. He knows where I will be, who I will know. We either believe this passage or we don't. And in the middle of that reading that we just read from Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 in particular, I want to focus on today. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You formed me. I didn't evolve. I am made. There's a little small place I want to go today with this. And, uh, and I'll try to get there this way. Creators and craftsmen and artists, people who create things, they want their product identified and traced back to them in days, years, centuries to come. Whether it was the maker of fine silver and silverware, or whether it was the maker of jewelry and fine rings and necklaces and pendants, or whether it's even pottery. People who make things want them traced back to them. Today I'm talking about people. And, 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 and a scripture setting that simply tells us, verses 13 and 14, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And no matter what your description and what you look like and how you walk or what color you are, how short or tall, how knowledgeable or how much you lack in that realm, how gifted, how spirited, how talented, all that you are, Everything within you that is capable of producing anything or not, you either believe it or you don't. You either were made by God or you just were nature's result. But if we are made by a creator, I suggest to you today that we simply should be thankful and accepting for what we are and for what we possess. Did you know self-approval and self-acceptance is actually a biblical concept? 
we, we, we mix and muddy religion with philosophy and psychology sometimes, and, and maybe it's impossible to separate them in some areas and in some ways, but most of the time we can make a clear distinction. In fact, uh, as some of you have studied uh, numerous aspects of psychology, as I have as well, and I have discovered that it seems like almost everything positive and good in, uh, in my studies of psychology could be traceable back to a scripture as well. Seems like most positive input came from scripture in spite of those who are naysayers and hate the Bible and hate God. You can trace almost every good concept back to a scripture somewhere. Did you know that Christ himself told a rich young man in Matthew 19, 18, when a young man came and said, Master, what, am I, what do I have to do to inherit life? And he said, well, obey the commandments. Well, which ones? And he named a few for him. And in, and, in, and in those few, he said, and honor your father and your mother, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And, and we just, you and I quote that as a passage of part of the extension of the law, and we just move on. But man, sometimes we ought to just stop and freeze frame for a moment and say, wait a minute. I get the idea that I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Hey, I turn the other cheek if they slap me and all those good things and forgive if I'm offended and pray for those who use me. But, 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 but what about that little tag on the end? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't love myself. I'm not supposed to, am I? I don't, am I supposed to love me? But if you were made by God, you were formed by him, you were created by him, does it make any sense that he would somehow be glorified and glamorized and he would be elevated and sanctified if that thing that he had created learned to perpetually say, I don't like me, I don't like the way I am? Doesn't it bring more glory to God for you to say, I like me. I like what I am. I'm not you. I'm glad. I've seen you. You're not all that. But I am. I like me. Oh, I exaggerate the point, but I'm trying to say everybody's thumbprints are your, our personalities, our hearts, our genes, the, the, the beats, the rhythm, or arrhythmia. I mean, everything about you, you were made. And he didn't make any copies, no clones. Even the twins that destiny gives birth to Tuesday will not be identical. They'll have different thumbprints. And they'll have different brains. And they'll have different personalities. Because he doesn't make copies he makes unique individual beings and then he tells us that as we grow we should love others as we love ourselves look at look at Paul's description in Ephesians 5:28 in the same way husbands good advice today especially at christmas time when i know some of your marriages are really stressed in the same way, husbands should love their wives. <laughs> I told you. I told you a while ago. You can't hurt him. I guarantee you, she would probably not admit it. But I will say it anyway. I'll bet my wife has questioned my clothing taste a few times somewhere along the way. The reason that I can't prove it is because it didn't make any difference when she said it then. It wouldn't make any today I would still say <laughs> I have walked by my wife and caught her disapproving look <laughs> and my brain says she doesn't think I should leave my shirt tail hanging out while I'm wearing a suit coat it's not cool tuck it in wear a belt and I just look back in the mirror and say I bet most men can't look this ragged and this good at the same time <laughs> just let the shirt tail hang out. I might even pull my coat sleeve up over my long sleeve shirt. Just let my shirt stick out. I don't care. Because I love my own body. So you husbands love your wives. It's not 
carpenter philosophy today, so don't worry about me polluting your brain. I'm reading the scripture. Husbands, love your own wives, even as much as you love your own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Do you know that the Bible is in a roundabout way trying to teach us the value and the power and the strength of accepting yourself the way you are? See, there's nothing in this scripture that hints at, well, if he's, if he's built right, if he's made right, of course, he loves himself. What if you're not built right? You still ought to love yourself. What if he, he, he dipped over toward the wrong genetic side of the pool? If you agree that God made us and formed us, then you have to accept I'm made the way God wanted me to be made. And I like myself. And it doesn't matter at that point whether anyone else likes you or not. The first step toward understanding what I'm going to talk to you about today is accepting who you are. Accepting yourself. If we are made by God, I want to share three things with you. We may or may not be beautiful to others. <clears throat> But it really doesn't matter. We are beautiful to the one who made us. And, and, and if you can accept that today, I might save you years of therapy and counseling and some money. You may not need to go. If you can stop worrying about what other people think about you, the way you look, the way you walk, the way your smile is, the way your mouth turns crooked, the way your nose is bent, the way your ears don't match. All those things are me. I don't care if you start analyzing and inspecting just to see if I'm telling you the truth. I don't care because your opinion of me doesn't matter anymore. It did when I was young and I was trying to measure up to other people and have something to prove I felt like and finally you grow and mature and you reach a place where you understand being accepted by God and being accepted by me much more critical to my success in life than somebody else's opinion. I remember the uh, first time that I was aware of my ears I was terribly terrified. My father had big ears. Uh, not big, they just went out really big. And, and I remember when I was young, saying something to my dad about it. And, um, and my dad said, hey, none of your business. I didn't mean it as an insult, I just didn't. And then for some reason, I don't know what age, there's a magical age. I, I don't know where it is. For me, it was probably around 10 because I fell in love for the first time with Miss Karstorff and my fifth grade teacher. I mean, I'm telling you seriously in love. I fell seriously in love with my fifth grade teacher. My brother's grandson is 10 years old. He called me last night, yesterday, Brennan. Uncle Danny, yes sir, I just read your story in the Chicken Soup for the Soul book. Which one? I've had three. <sighs> Which one? The one about when you was in Vietnam and the hand. And I said, oh, well good, what'd you think about it? He said, it's a really good story. I know who the hand was. He's 10. My brother had let him have his phone to call me. He said, I know who the hand was. I said, you do who? He said, it was Jesus, wasn't it? I said, well, I think so. I'm glad you read the story. Why don't you get your grandpa to read it now and then? <laughs> well, he, he read it too. But I just wanted to say, I really liked the story. And, and, when it, and when it came to that where 
it said, and you, you opened your eyes and there was no hand there. I knew, I knew when I got there it was Jesus. And I said, well, you're a smart boy. What do you say to, when you're 66, what do you say to a 10-year-old kid? I didn't know what else to say. I said, well, that's good. I'm glad you read the story. Thank you for liking it. And then there's this pause. Okay, you still there? Uh-huh. I'm driving. Well, talk to me, you know. Well, what else you got going on? Uh, well, I just wanted to call you about the story. Okay. So, uh, lacking anything else to know to say, I said, how old are you? Ten. Oh, that's a good age, I said. Uh-huh. I said, you know why? Because I fell in love when I was 10 years old for the first time in my life. Really? Yes, sir. Ooh. I said, you know who I fell in love with? My fifth grade teacher. What's your teacher look like? Is she pretty? Uh, kind of. Okay, well, never mind then. You're not going to fall in love with her. She's got to be drop dead gorgeous for a 10-year-old boy to fall in love with, with his teacher. And when I fell in love in the fifth grade, it was the first time that I started paying attention to my appearance. And then I got paranoid. I made my mother make sure my clothes matched. Nowadays, you kids wouldn't know what matching is. But in those days, if you had a green shirt on, you wanted pants that went with green. Not you just, I don't care. We've got holes in them. That's cool. And if you had holes in them in those days, you threw them away and started with something else. You wanted socks to match. And so I would lay my clothes out on the floor every night to get ready, for, to make sure I was ready for the next day. I, it had to be ready. had to be right. I did that for most of the fifth grade after I fell in love with her in the first day of school. And then somewhere in that year, I, 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 it was time for a haircut. And, and I, I knew I needed one because boys kept their hair trimmed up. And... And I went to the barber for the first time in, 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 to, in, to see myself. You know, you know how it is. Until you get to a certain age, your parent just says, Come on, we got to go to the barber shop and get a haircut. Oh! And you go with your dad and you sit down and you get a haircut. But in the ten, in, at 10 years old, I wanted a haircut. I went to the barber. What do you want me to do, young man? Well, you know, whatever. And, uh, and when he got through, I looked in the mirror and I realized, Oh, no. <laughs> One of my ears sticks out farther than the other ear does. I had never seen that. I was 10 years old in love with Miss Carstarfin. And for the first time, I realized I wasn't perfect. I was malformed, and, and it bothered me. It seriously bothered me. I, I, remember, I remember trying to, I, in fact, I asked my mother about, uh, you know, why does this ear? And she said, oh, son, it does not. Mothers are blind. They just tell you, oh, you're so cute. No, 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 really seriously. And I remember thinking there's got to be some way. I would, I would lay more on that side thinking that I would, when I was in bed, thinking I'd press that ear against my head. And, uh, and so after I realized I could grow my hair longer, I just started letting my hair grow longer. And I did that all the way through high school, and then I got drafted. And when I got drafted... Uh, they don't really give you a choice in haircuts, you men that know. You just go in and they just, and it's gone. And then they take your picture for your military ID card. I still got mine. And, and I look at it and I think, I never knew that. I mean, I remember thinking maybe when I was 10, but I had forgotten it till I was 18. And then, and then there it is. And, uh, and it was okay. You know, sometime along about 13, 14 years old, I started realizing my nostril was out of balance. And one side nostril is bigger than the other side nostril. And then I realized, oh my gosh, look, this eyebrow right here is completely thicker than this eyebrow over here. I have to trim this one. The, the barber, when I get a haircut now, she will say, do you want me to trim your eyebrow? <laughs> and I will say, oh, thank you. You meant both of them. Well, this one, it, yes. And she and, and when I was 15, I wouldn't have told you that stuff about me. No, sir. Because I hadn't fully accepted my uniqueness, and it's who I am, and it's the way I'm made. 
But I don't care. You can study them if you want to. But you want to come look at them in the foyer tonight, today? I don't care. Doesn't bother me in the slightest. I am what I am. I was made by God this way. I like me. I like what I've become. Because I like myself, it's a lot easier for me to love my wife. God, you ought to see her imperfections. <laughs> And they mean nothing to me now that I know I have them and I still like me. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm applying scripture. Let a husband love his wife even as he loves his own body. There's a connection between the way we treat each other and the way Christ treats us. And if we don't love ourselves, we will abuse those in our families. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat in that office and offices in the past and dealt with couples facing physical abuse and violence and I realize he's only violent because he still hates who he is. If he could ever understand that he doesn't have to be angry, doesn't have to blame God, doesn't have to be mad at the world and mad at himself. He'll stop being mad at other people. Once in a while it works. And once in a while I tell a woman just get away from him. And then he winds up in prison and then he gets out of prison and comes looking for me. That happens about every four years. It happened just recently. Thankfully he forgot the things I told his wife in front of him before he went back to prison. And he came by to thank me. I just want to thank you for your honesty. You know I've been in prison the last four years. Yes, yes. Because you beat your wife and she reported you. And we're helping a girl right now. Have y'all seen the, did anybody see the little ad I put out? I ask you if you know anybody has an old car you can donate or, or you can contribute to us buying a cheap car somewhere. We're going we're to try to help a girl who's living in the shelter right now up at Montgomery Women's Shelter for Battered Women. And uh, she used to be a member in this church. And Sandy and I ran into her and found out she's estranged from her kids because she had to go to this battered women's shelter. And uh, if she gets a car within the next 45 days, they will let her. She's got a job and, uh, in the woodlands. And they'll let her move into a little apartment and she can have her kids back if she gets transportation within the next 45 days. Or from that's actually been two weeks now. So when we get back to the holidays, we're going to help find her some kind of old car. We'll, we'll buy a $2,000 car somewhere. You'll, you'll do that. And, and we'll do it. Because she has been unfortunate enough to be married to a man who never learned to love himself. And therefore, he never knew how to love his wife. And he abused her and abused children because he hasn't accepted who he is. Made by God. Formed by God. Genetically created by God. Romans 8.33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God. God justifies me. You can, you can be mad at me all day long. I can be mad at you, but our opinion of each other matters zero. God made you. God's the one who justifies you. Learn how to connect just you and God as your creator. And then it really won't matter whether anybody else thinks you're cool or hip or pretty or handsome. It doesn't matter. It only matters what you and God understand between the two of you. Number two, <clears throat> we may not ever know our purpose through our connections and relationships to other people. But our connection to God will become our purpose if we get it. Colossians 1, 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. I am a created being. I am made by God. God and I was made for God I wasn't made for you you weren't made for me you weren't made for your spouse you were made for God that means for God to do whatever God wanted to do with you were made the way God wanted you to be made wouldn't it be crazy if everybody in the world was a plumber 
But nobody knew how to build a house or build a toilet or build a sink because everybody was a plumber. When Paul tried to describe the body of Christ, you and were members of the body, he said, don't, don't fuss because you're not the eye. You, you shouldn't say, well, I want to be the eye, but I'm the ear. If the body, if ever the whole body was an eye, how would it hear? He's being comical. He's being humorous, but he's trying to illustrate something. Everybody has a different role and a different function and a different purpose. And the purpose is really God's choosing and God's design and God's mystery, not ours. You can spend a lot of time being angry at God and then trying to make yourself something you are not. And the scripture even warns us about that. Shall the thing formed say to he who formed it? We'll read that verse in a minute. Number three, if you accept the idea that you're made by God, then you should consider your blemishes to be nothing more than the creator's mark. Many years ago, I was invited to uh, pray the invocation at a, uh, at a, a conclave of parents with children who had disabilities, they said, and that was the phrase that was used. And, and uh, not knowing what else to pray in that uh, invocation, I simply asked God's blessings on the meetings and on the, the, the few days to follow. And then I said, <clears throat> and, uh, and thank you, uh, God, our wonderful creator, that you have a way of putting your unique mark on all of us. And at this assembly, those unique marks may be more visible than elsewhere, but we are still grateful for the mark our Creator has put on us. As you might understand, I was much younger then, and as you might guess, uh, uh, as typical with me, half uh, the people like something I say and half the people don't. And as you probably could guess, a couple of mothers came up to me and said, oh, I just love that phrase. I, I, I like the idea that it's the Creator's mark. And, and then there were those who came up to me and said, uh, I, I really just, I don't know what to say to you, but that was so offensive to me. Really? And, and one of those mothers, uh, her son uh, was uh, affected by thalamide, her older son. Her son was already in his 20s by then. And he had been a victim of thalamide poisoning. And it had robbed her son of uh, most of one arm. The arm was only as long as to the elbow. <coughs> and uh, the hand was missing on the other arm and actually just a couple of fingers on the end of the, the stump of that arm. And unfortunately, she was offended by my comments and she had raised her son and taught her son that he was uh, the victim of uh, thalamide poisoning. And that's why he was born that way. So he had spent all of his teen years and, and his young adult years, he was already in his 20s, he had spent all of that time angry at life because he had been victimized by thalamide poisoning. And therefore he was angry at God for allowing him to be a victim. Why wouldn't God have stopped it? And, and I asked that mother at one point in her quiet anger at me. She fortunately was off to the side and just venting. And so finally at one point I just said, may I ask what your son is doing now? And she said, well, he's doing nothing. And I said, well, I mean, what is he? He's, he's, he's in his 20s. What, what does he work? Well, he can't work. Well, he, he could. He, no, we, we take care of him. He stays home. We take, and, and this was years ago. This was actually before Johnny Erickson Tata dove off a diving board and broke her neck and was paralyzed from the waist down. And, and, and her Christian faith didn't even blame God for that accident. Her Christian faith just made her learn to put a paintbrush between her teeth and paint the most exquisite paintings and then find a way to sell them and, and then write and publish some books until she actually has become quite a character and quite well known and quite famous for her paintings and her authorship and quite well off as it turns out in the long run. And, and if you've ever heard her speak, you know that she has no blame for anyone. 
she has only praise and gratitude that she's still alive and and she suffered a tragic accident that instead of destroying her it just redirected her steps and she learned that God was so gracious in the making of her that he made her a survivor no matter what happened to her in life what a contrast between that philosophy and theology and the mother who had simply bred anger and rage against the misfortunate incidents of thalamide poisoning. Hey, there's something to be said for just accepting who you are and accepting the way you're made. This week, I hate to even get into it, but this week, for lack of a better phrase, we'll stay on the blemishes. A famous person was in Houston uh, and visited uh, two mega churches. And uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but, uh, you know, Bruce Caitlin Jenner uh, made an appearance for his TV show in Houston so he could visit uh, two of the churches pastored by two of the Houston pastors who were adamantly and outwardly opposed to Mayor Anise Parker's demand that uh, all bathrooms in Houston become uh, gender neutral. Men can go in women's bathrooms if they feel like they identify as a woman and vice versa. And a whole bunch of pastors in Houston said, over our dead bodies, this is not going to happen. And so they, they passed a bunch of those. Uh, the, the pastors uh, uh, got a 61, 62% vote against it. And Bruce Jenner uh, uh, used to be a male Olympic champion and then decided that he, he's not a man, he's a woman. And, and in our society, perverted from the things of God and the truth of God's word. Instead of helping such a man find identity and acceptance as who he is, we simply funnel him over to the greedy doctors who have no morals and no ethics and the greedy scientists and researchers who will take your money and do anything to your body. But it calls to mind Romans the ninth chapter in verse 20 that says, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what has been formed say to he who formed it, Why have you made me like this? So I guess Bruce Jenner just wanted to come to Houston so he could use the the ladies' bathroom in two mega churches, and and hope that it made a huge press scene, and fortunately it didn't. In fact, Dr. Ed Young down at Second Baptist was one of the churches. He just met with him and prayed with him and let him take the pictures of him and Bruce Caitlin Jenner talking and praying in the foyer of the church. God bless him. But the sad thing for Bruce is that he clearly didn't accept the way he was made. And he clearly felt like he could have done a better job than God did. And he's clearly a broken and sad and disturbed and troubled man, woman. And our coming generations may be equally disturbed and troubled because we're breeding ground right now in America for people to not like the way they're made. To think they could have done a better job than even God himself but it's not true. God made you. You might not occasionally like the way you look. I used to wish that I had a better build, especially when I had to take my shirt off in PE. I went into the army weighing 145 pounds. In eight weeks in boot camp, I weighed 175 pounds. That tells you something about my mother's cooking. My mother was the worst cook in the world. When I got drafted, you could see my ribs. And I, I had no clue those were powdered eggs. I'm telling you the honest to God's truth. By the third morning in line in boot camp for those eggs, I, I heard a couple of guys saying, oh, is that all we're going to ever get to eat of these old cruddy powdered eggs? And I said, are these powdered? It's the best eggs I've ever had. I thought the food in the military was was outstanding. My mother, God love her, she was never a cook. Mom's idea of a gourmet meal was, hey, look, I split the weenie and laid a little strip of cheese in there and melted it. That's gourmet. 
You open that can of pork and beans with a split wiener with chili. I mean, with cheese in it. You up, you upscale eat. I put on 30 pounds in eight weeks in boot camp. Same, same 28 waist. 30 pounds that actually just covered my ribs. I didn't, I didn't, I, I don't, I don't know that I ever looked in the mirror and liked who I was when I was a kid. I'm not even sure I started liking myself till I was probably in my 30s or 40s. But at some point in life, it started occurring to me that God is such a grand designer. He knows exactly what it takes to make seven billion different people operate around this world and everybody's got to have a different talent, a different inclination, a different skill, a different way of thinking, a different way of looking. We need the critics as much as we need the applause. We, we need the, the, some of the best things ever happened to me was people criticized what I did because it made me go back and genuinely inspect my behavior, my language, what I said. And if everybody had just patted me on the back and said, that's good, I'd have just kept being a knucklehead forever. So I needed people who had a different mindset, a different way of viewing things and looking. God, bless us because we're different. And it makes us all fit better. The family works better. The body of Christ works better. And you work better when you finally accept that and realize, I'm, I'm made by God this way. I'm made by God this way. Everybody can't have one eyebrow bigger than the other one. Be jealous. Be envious. In fact, this one will even grow more white hairs than this one will grow. One day I may just let them grow out and tell the barber, no, don't trim the eyebrow. Let it grow till it falls over my glasses. Then I'll curl it. I'll be unique. Doesn't matter. God made me. So stand with me, please, and just read this last thing up here on the deal. Only, only put I there instead of you. I am beautiful. Say it out loud. I am beautiful. No, you're not. Does it matter to you if I say no, you're not? Nope. Because you only answer to the one who made you. God made you. And to God, you are His elect. You are beautiful to Him. His opinion is the only one that matters. You and God have purpose and value together. Just you and Him. You are beautiful. Please learn to accept yourself the way you are. Father in heaven, thank you today. Thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you for making us. We believe you formed us in our mother's womb made us all just the way we are. Forgive us for the years we waste and spend insecure and undecided and hunting and struggling for identity. Forgive us that sometimes it takes us so long in our own search for significance that we waste some wonderful years when we wouldn't have had to search just accept the way you made us. We are your gift to the world. We are your design. We each have your unique stamp the Creator's mark on all of us. Thank you for the gift of life and thank you for the gift of your presence and thank you for the family you integrated all of us into, this family of life. In Christ's 